In uh, 2 Samuel, in chapter number 23. And again, thank you for being here. It always does a pastor's heart good to see some people in the auditorium. <laughs> it's a lot nicer to preach to people than empty chairs. And so I'm glad you're here. And you folks who are watching, uh, we're looking forward to the day when you're back. I think the uh, with, with COVID taking a nosedive, the numbers are going down really fast and the vaccines are out and a lot of people are vaccinated and it seems like there's uh, all the statistics show that uh, there's not as much uh, havoc being caused by the coronavirus and so I'm looking forward uh, this warm weather coming on and uh, the sunshine just killing it out let's pray that God will just kill the virus out completely I'm kind of tired of it in 2nd Samuel chapter number 23 I had thought I would read maybe starting in verse number 1, but I believe I'll just go down to verse number 8. And we're in the catalog of David's mighty men. King David had some men. This is before he became king, and he was on the run quite a while from King Saul, who was trying to kill him, because he knew David was destined for the throne. Amen. And he had some mighty warriors with him. He had some men of war that knew their business. And here they're called the mighty men. And there's a whole list of them. And of that list, there's three that are called mighty men that seem to be ranked above. Maybe they're more, because of more power, more authority, more skill, because they were, they were soldiers par excellence. And we'll see them here in verse number eight. These be the names of the mighty men whom David had. The Tachmanite that sat in the seat, chief among the captains. The same was Adino the Esnite. He lift up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. And after him was Eleazar the son of Dodo the Ahohite, one of the three mighty men with David. When they defied the Philistines, that were gathered, they're gathered together to battle, and the men of Israel were gone away. He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary, and his hand clave unto the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. And after him was, and I want you to pay attention to verse number 11 and 12. These are the two text verses we'll use tonight. And after him was Shem. Shammah, the son of Aji, the Hararite, and the Philistines were gathered together into a troop. Where was a piece of ground full of lentils, and the people fled from the Philistines. But he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines, and the Lord wrought a great victory." Father, we pray that you'd bless us as we look into your precious word. We pray that you'd empower the message with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We pray that you'd anoint our ears that we might hear truth, and you'd anoint our, 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 our hearts that we might apply it to our lives. I pray, Lord, that you'd have your will and your way, both in the message and in our lives. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. I want to entitle the message, Defending your ground. I think uh, there was a law passed recently, wasn't there, Joey, uh, in Arkansas, stand your ground law? Uh, I didn't think of that until just now, but uh, defending your ground is what we want to talk about tonight. And this passage of scripture tells us about David's mighty men, and they were a group of highly trained soldiers that fought with David and aided him in all of his victories, and they went where he went. They, uh, these three, the three mighties, are said to have been his personal bodyguards. I mean, those guys knew their business, and if I, if I was going to have somebody to defend me and be my bodyguard, that kind of the three would be the kind I'd want, wouldn't you? They're, they're described in their exploits in these verses, and uh, several of these men would be worthy to preach on, and I have preached on I guess all of them at some time or other, but I want to just focus on Shammah tonight. This man, Shammah, took a stand 
against overwhelming odds, against the enemy who was the, the Philistines who routinely marauded and attacked Israel. And he won a great victory that day with the Lord's help. And he is a man from whom we could learn a few things from about defending our ground. When they came, the Philistines, when they came, all the people in that area fled. They ran away. They were afraid of the enemy. They were afraid of the Philistines. They feared for their lives, and so they left. And, and Shammah was there alone, and he took his stand in the field of lentils or a type of beans or peas, and uh, I like purple holes personally, but these were just, the Bible says they're lentils, and so uh, there's a lot of different kinds of beans. There's green beans and pinto beans and black beans, and barley is even a bean. Did you know that? And there's different places in the Bible where, where the Bible talks about uh, barley fields and so forth. So these were all grains, and, and it's said that those, those lentils were a very tasty, delightful vegetable bean that they would eat. And so... Evidently, these Philistine soldiers came to this area and as they marauded through the land of the Israelites, their purpose was to kill and pass fear onto them and then to destroy, eat their crops and what they didn't eat, they would destroy the rest. That's pretty sad. And the, the Philistines had caused a great deal of fear in the Israelites and, and uh, they had evidently been camping there in this uh, bean field and because of the provision, the troop of Philistines were camped there and they were eaten out of the bean field. And no doubt when they had finished the next day or however long they stayed in that camp, they would have moved on, but they would probably have, they would have either have burned the, that field of beans so the Israelites would have nothing to eat, they would be starved, or they would have just tromped it down, run the troop of men through the field and trampled down every bit of food that's possible. They were going to leave them hungry. And I'd like for us to take just a few minutes this evening to look at this man named Shema and see if we can learn some lessons from him. There is a time to fight even when others are running away. And Shema shows us that. There is a time to fight when others are not willing. There is a time to fight when others may even run away. There is a fight that we have today. There are numerous fights that we have today. And I want to preach on the subject, defend your ground. I saw a video this morning of a water buffalo that had been brought down to the ground by a large lion. The lion had that water buffalo by the throat. And he had that buffalo down where the water buffalo could not move, looked like he couldn't breathe, and the lion had a death grip on him right there. He was waiting for the buffalo to die so he could have lunch. And he was... He was Hacked on there, man. He was locked on there, and he wasn't moving. The lion had the buffalo down, and it looked like the buffalo was going to die. I don't much like to watch those kind of videos because it turns out bad sometimes. I feel bad for the loser. And so I watched it, though. It was kind of like a train wreck. I couldn't turn away. I had to see what was going to happen. And as the lion laid there with his teeth clenched around the throat of the water buffalo lying on the ground, the herd of buffalo began to creep up, and they're looking like they're just interested in what's going on and they want to see. And so one or two of them would kind of creep up a little closer and take a look at what was going on and then if, if it looked like the lion's eyes moved towards them, they'd jump back. And so there was a whole herd of water buffalo, but they would, they would flinch back in fear. They didn't want to be lunch. And so it went on for several minutes. And finally, after several had advanced close to the line and then retreated, one brave animal. One old ox walks up and he gets closer and closer and suddenly you can tell he's thinking, what am I going to do? And he lunges at the lion and the lion turns loose of the other ox's throat and he runs off about 50 feet. And he's standing there watching. He doesn't want to lose his lunch. And so he's thinking about coming back to see if he can reclaim that injured Water buffalo. Well, so the lion starts coming back, and then this buffalo that had ran him off lunges at him again, and the whole herd comes with him this time, and they're all going towards the lion, and the lion 
little Chuck. He left out and he didn't come back. And so I said, hooray for the buffalo on the ground. He made it, praise the Lord. You know what? <clears throat> I think it took one brave water buffalo to convince the others to have enough courage to move forward with him. And people are kind of that way, aren't we? Say amen every once in a while so I know you're awake. <laughs> well, the Bible says the devil, like a roaring lion, he's prowling about too, seeking whom he may devour among human beings and especially God's people. He's not too worried about the lost crowd because he already has their soul. And as a saved person, he can't get your soul, but he can render you ineffective so others will see your testimony and others will fear and others will shrink back and maybe no more will get saved. The devil is shrewd. The devil is wily. The devil is smarter than we are. The Philistines were trying to destroy the Israelites in our text, but Shammah came along. There's three aspects of this story I want to show you tonight. <laughs> First of all, it was a time of great conflict. Look in verse number 11 again. It says, And after him was Shammah, the son of Aji, the Hararite, and the Philistines were gathered. Now the Philistines were the sworn enemy of Israel. They were coming there time and again, and as, they, <coughs> as the Midianites had done <coughs> before, they would try to destroy the land, starve the people out, and hoping the people would leave and they could take their land. And this was a time of great conflict. The Philistines were attacking the people of God. Notice when the enemy came. The enemy came, evidently, since there was beans there, there were lentils on the plants ready to eat. Evidently, it was around harvest time. And what happens is the Philistines, they come on the scene just as the, the produce is ready to pick and the Israelites are busy. They're preparing, they're preparing for harvest. I mean, they're thinking about harvest. This is a great, a great time of great joy. They're coming to, they live there. They're going to harvest these beans and they're going to have food for the coming year. And so they're busy going about their business, doing what they feel like they need to be doing, but they weren't ready for war. And the Philistines come on the scene and they attack at this time because Israel is not ready. And many times God's people today are not ready for a battle coming from the devil. We're happy thinking everything is just rolling along. Everything's going sweet. You know, we're having a good time. We're, we're singing to the Lord. And you, know, you know, the devil doesn't mind if you have church. And he doesn't mind if you sing a hymn or two. But when you get really serious about serving God, when you say, boy, I'm going to sell out lock, stock, and barrel. I'm going, to start, I'm going to start witnessing to people. I'm going to be faithful to come to all the church services. I'm going, to, I'm going to start tithing. I'm going to start giving. I'm going to start being a real Christian on a regular basis. Now, when you get serious like that, the devil doesn't like it. And if you're not prepared, you're doing all the good things that a Christian ought to be doing. And that's when the devil sneaks up. And that's what he did with these, what the Philistines did with these Israelites. The people fled. They were ill prepared for battle. And that's what the devil, hey, you know why you need to come to church all the time? Prepare for battle. Amen. There is no discharge in this war. And if we're not ready, if we're not expecting the devil to come on the scene, he can enter in and he can tear up your family. He can tear up your church. He can render you ineffective. And we have to be prepared. And so therefore, we read the Bible and we pray. And we go to church and we listen to sermons and Sunday school lessons because it, it helps us to read the manual of life. And that's how we get prepared. These people were not prepared and so the enemy comes against us at a time when we're not prepared. You remember in Revelation uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, when Jesus is talking to the church at Ephesus through the apostle John as he recorded it. And Jesus in that passage of scripture talks about 
you've done this and this is good and you've done that and that's good and you've done the other thing and that's good. However, I have something against you. You've left your first love. And while we're busy running here and there and doing this and that, we better learn to always love the Lord. Amen. Always loving the Lord. And he said, I've got somewhat against you, church. Well, we better keep loving God. Notice why the enemy came. They came for two reasons, to inflict casualties and to destroy the crops. That's what they were about. What does the devil do when he comes to us? He's looking to inflict casualties. He wants to see you drop out of church. He wants to see you quit trying to live for God. He wants to see you stop witnessing. He wants to see you stop praying. He wants to inflict casualties. How's he doing? And he wants to destroy your crops, things that you've produced in your Christian life. Maybe your family, maybe your testimony. Huh? He'll destroy your testimony. He wants to get your crops. We try to serve God and then trouble seems to come. You ever notice that? Just about the time you say, boy, you heard a revival message and you say, man, I want to start being faithful to church. And the devil will find some way to try to keep you out. You say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give to the Lord's work. And the devil will find some way to put you in doubt whether you can do it or not. I'm going to witness to somebody. And then the devil comes along and puts fear in your heart. See if he can knock you out. He wants to destroy your crops. What did the enemy find when they came here? Well, when the enemy of the Philistines came, they found no opposition. Now here's... Now we're getting down to the nitty gritty of why I wanted to bring this message because in America today, there's way too many people who are not opposing anything. We used to have more influence as God's people than we do now. There was a time when the preacher was a respected man in town. Now they try to make him look like the buffoon. There was a time when the house of God was a place that was revered and people trusted and people were attracted to the house of God. And now they find everything else to do. Plenty on TV. I mean, we got 900, 950,000 channels on Dish, so why do we need to go to church? We got plenty to watch. And if that's not enough, we can get on the internet and we can play all day. So why do I need to go to church? And people are not opposing anything. And we have all of this social justice going on, you know. If you try to oppose anything, they will put fear in your heart and you can't stand up against anything because they'll call you a bigot, a racist. They'll call you a homophobe if you try to stand against anything. If you've got a different belief, you've got a different opinion, they will try to shame you into submitting to their way of believing and their way of thinking and their way of doing. And so a lot of people are afraid to face that. and They won't stand up. They flee like these Israelites in terror. Nobody wants to stand. But it's time that we as Christians stand and look the devil square in the eye, look the enemy square in the eye, look the cohorts of the devil square in the eye and say, by the grace of God, I'll stand. By the grace of God, I will not kneel. By the grace of God, I will only kneel to Christ. By the grace of God, I won't give in. I won't give up. I'm going to stand my ground. If you find out that your marriage is in trouble, what are you going to do? Throw in the towel and say, well, it was fun while it lasted. We'll call it quits and we'll find another one. Remember you gave a vow that you're going to love her, love him forever. What are you going to do? Throw in the towel and let the devil have his way? Or are we going to fight and say, I'm standing my ground. I'll do what the Bible says I need to do to protect that marriage. Boy, we need some more of that. What about your kids? You say, man, the kids won't mind me. They don't respect me. They won't listen to me. They sass me and back talk me. Well, what are you going to do? Just throw up your hands and say, I quit. They win. You're going to throw them over to the devil and let him have charge of your kids? Or are you going to say, by the grace of God, I will stand. I will train them. If it doesn't work today, I'll try again tomorrow. I will stand and defend 
my ground. Some courage. That's what Shammah had. He said, I'm going to stand. I'm not leaving. The rest of the people are running away, but I'm going to stand here and fight. I've got my spear, I've got my sword, and I'm taking them on, buddy. Shammah's a courageous man. He knew he was on the Lord's side. What are you going to do when someone tries to discourage you about your church and they begin to criticize your church? Are you going to tuck your tail and agree with them? Are you going to stand up on your hind legs and say, by the grace of God, I'll not run away. By the grace of God, I will not apologize for being a member of the church of the Lord. By the grace of God, I believe it's the right thing to do and I'm going to keep on doing it. Stand your ground. Teachers and parents afraid to stand up against the school system because they want to teach your kindergartners about homosexual sex. And what do we do? Many times we flee in terror. What are we going to do? Turn them over to the devil and say, let, let the school system have them. Let the idiots in Washington, D.C. And, and all over the country who are designing the literature trying to turn our children over to social justice and, and trans transgenderism and all of the other isms that's going on. Are we going to just do it? Because we don't want to, well, we're called a homophobe or a racist or a bigot. You know I'm telling you the truth. It's time we stand and defend our ground. Go to that PTA meeting and tell the, tell the school board what you object to. Let them know my kids are not going to be involved in junk like this. Write your senators and your representatives. Talk to the school board. Talk to the people, the teachers who run your school. Say, I don't want my kids learning that junk. If you don't take it out, I'm going to homeschool them. That's what I'd be doing anyway. We did this 30 years ago. It ain't getting any better. I was on the school board. I was elected to the school board. And probably 77, I guess. And as long as I was, you know, I was lost at the time. Everybody liked me because I'd drink and party with them and do all that stuff. And they thought I was a good school board member then. But then I got saved. <laughs> when I got saved, they didn't like the way I was standing up against the rest of the school board. There were five of us on the school board in our local school. And I was... I was standing up against them when they were doing heathen activities. And I got voted down four to one most of the time. But they knew somebody was standing for right. After I got saved, then I surrendered to preach and decided the Lord wanted us to go off to Bible college. And when, I, when I did, that's when I resigned the school board. But not until they wanted me to resign earlier. The people in the community said, you ought to resign. You, you put your kids in a Christian school and here you are on the public school board. Why don't you resign? I said, just because I pulled my kids out and put them in the Christian school doesn't mean I want the rest of the kids to go to hell. So when I moved away to Oklahoma City, I had to resign then because I was leaving the state to become a resident of another state. But we need some people to stand. When the devil tells you, take that stimulus check and take that tax return and eat, drink, and be merry, live it up and blow it. Boy, you'll have a good time for a few days or a few weeks. Don't worry about being behind on your rent. Don't worry about always being perpetually late on your car payment. Don't worry about that stuff. Don't worry about paying something ahead. Don't worry about putting some money in a savings account. The devil's saying that to you. <laughs> Hello? Well, it gets quiet in here stuff like that. <laughs> the devil says, blow it. Don't pay bills with it. Are you going to give in to the devil again or are you just going to say, I'm standing my ground this time. Some of that goes in the bank. Some of it goes to pay some payments ahead so I don't feel the lion's grip around my throat every month. Well, that's good preaching. I'm going to come down there and amen myself in a minute. <clears throat> The feds and the styles and the fashions that try to homogenize 
the men and women, boys and girls, all into one unisex clump. Just say no. I'm going to stand my ground. That's what we're going to do with, at this church. We've been here for 24 years. In October, be 24 years, and we've had standards for our leaders in the church. If they want to, if they want to live like the Lord, like they love the Lord, and dress, man dresses like a man, a woman dresses like a woman, then they will be candidates for leadership. If not, then they wait. Why is that? Because there's some things that's worth defending. I don't want to see our whole nation go down in flames when we can't tell the difference between a man and a woman. When they don't know which bathroom to go to. It's time we stood up, ladies and gentlemen, and not be ashamed like Shammah say, I'm going to stand the ground whether the rest of you run back and hide or not. I'm going to stand here and defend my bean field. Hello. Praise the Lord. Somebody tries to belittle you for using a King James Bible and they tell you how full of errors it is. Say, wait a minute, I'm going to have to stand up right here and disagree with you. I'm riding in a Rolls Royce. I don't want to go back to a skateboard. <laughs> I'm just simply saying, we ought to learn from Shama how to defend our ground. Our little fields are worth doing battle with the enemy for. Yes. It was a time of great conflict. Number two, it was a, a time of great courage. Shammah's resolve. My, I mean, I am resolved no longer to linger. I am resolved. He had to make up his mind ahead of time. Do you think he went out in that field scratching his head saying, well, I don't know whether to fight this battle or not. No, he made up his mind. His heart was settled a long time ago. So when the battle comes to you, you'll know what you're going to do. You don't have to hide in the corner and think about it and pray about it. You've already prayed and you already know what you're going to do. Some things are worth standing for. Some things are worth defending. And I think I know some of them. Shammah was resolved. The Bible says here that Shammah stood Notice that in verse number 12. But he stood in the midst of the ground. As Lester Roloff used to say, this ain't a recreational hall, bud. This is a battle. Amen. <laughs> and why so many churches are dying and becoming worthless in influencing America is because they decided it's a recreation hall. We need to be in the battle. Shammah had made up his mind. Maybe he had run before. Maybe there was a time when he ran from the enemy. But boy, this time he said, I ain't running this time. I'm meeting you face to face, Jack. We're going to do battle. And I'll die before I run. That was the way Shammah looked at it. So it is in church. We couldn't just stand back and, and let our church go downhill and become like every other church in the world. But I think a church ought to be different than the world. Yes. I think a church ought to stand for what's right and not be ashamed to say so. What was Shammah's reason? Those people would perish without food. And these Philistine troops were going to burn the field, eat it all, or carry it away. And he said, my people will starve. And that's why we need preachers in the pulpit. The Bible says that, that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And so many feel-good sermons get preached and never people challenge to do anything big for God. We must be willing to stand. Shammah was. He said, I'm going to see that you got food, folks. What was his reward? Well, his reward was he, he had a great victory that day. See, that's the good news. It says in the last part of verse 12, and the Lord wrought a great victory. Shammah's reward was that the enemy didn't prevail. Amen. I've seen so many compromises in my years in the ministry, so many lost battles. It ought not to be that way. I have a fear. 
There's some things I'm afraid of. I fear the Lord, for one. I fear to do wrong. I fear not to stand with Him. I have another fear. I fear that when I'm gone, the compromise in the country will be even worse. The compromise among churches will even be worse. I just hope it doesn't happen in my lifetime. That would be worse still. I want to stand while I'm here. We must take a stand for the things of the Lord. Now there's some things that we ought not to fight for. Some things we ought not to fight over. I mean there's some things that's just, it's not a hill worth dying on. You know what I'm saying? Fight for the things that are worthy of battle. <laughs> but don't pick a fight just to be mean. Christian ought to be sweet. Christian ought to have the heart of a dove and the hide of a rhinoceros. We ought not just go around picking fights. We ought to be with, able to withstand the fiery darts of the devil but still keep a tender heart. Not pick fights just to be fighting. I've, I've seen churches that just want to fight. I mean, they just fight over anything. I've used the illustration here once about having a fight with a boy when I was in school. And uh, we had a little boy sitting near the back that came to church regular back then. And Adam heard me tell that story. I don't, I don't know if he ever listened to anything else I preached or not, but he, he listened intently to me telling the story of a fight I had with a boy in school. And I, talk, I talked about punching this boy. And uh, so the next Sunday morning, Adam came in. He said, Preacher, guess what I did this week? I thought you were going to tell me you made an A-plus a on a report card or something. He said, guess what I did? I said, what did you do, Adam? He said, I went to school and punched somebody in the nose. I said, what? He said, well, you told about that story when you did. And he said, I thought I wanted to be like my preacher, so I went to school and punched somebody in the nose. I said, no, that's not what I meant. <laughs> there's, there's times when you need to stand, and there's times when you need to fight, but you don't need to fight just to be fighting. Right. There needs to be a cause. David said, is there not a cause? This was a time of great conflict. It was a time of great courage. And lastly, it was a time of great conquest. Verse 12 tells us that the one who really won the victory was God. Yes. When we begin to brag on ourselves about how strong we are in the Lord, what does the Bible say? A haughty spirit goeth before a great fall. We need to give credit where credit is due. And when the Lord does something in our life, we need to make sure he gets the credit for it. He gave Shammah the ability to stand. He gave Shammah the power to fight. He gave Shammah the skill to fight with. He gave Shammah the ability to have a victory in the midst of these enemies. It was the same when David walked into the valley and faced Goliath. It was the same type of battle when the three Hebrew children faced the fiery furnace. And they said, King, we're not going to bow to the idol. He said, I'm going, to throw you in the I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace if you don't. He said, well, we believe God will deliver us, but if not, we're still not going to bow to the idols. I kind of like those boys, don't you? They weren't willing to bow to the idol. The Lord defended the ground because one man was willing to stand and fight. That one man, through the power of God, saved the, a nation from starvation and extinction. The story I told that Adam tried to mimic punching somebody in the nose, I'll use it again because it does illustrate a point. I was kind of a scrawny little kid. I wasn't big and muscular like I am now when I was in about fourth grade. You're supposed to laugh there. And I, I had a friend, Jimmy Bobbitt, and I think we were in fourth grade. And we'd get out on the playground at recess time, and we'd play for a little bit. And Jimmy was, he was kind of stocky built, and he was strong, and he, he had a powerful will. And he would always want to tell me what to do and boss me around and make me do what he wanted me to do. And if I tried to balk, he'd grab me by the arm, twist my arm up behind my back, and boy, he'd twist it till it hurt. He'd make me do what he wanted. 
Well, I went home and told my brother about it, my older brother. I said, Jimmy, Bob, it's wearing me out at school. He, he's doing this, and I told him the story. He said, well, I'll tell you what you need to do. Tomorrow, go to school. At recess time, when Jimmy tries to grab you by the arm and twist it behind your back, you just turn around and punch him right in the nose. I said, Jimmy's bigger than I am. I said, his arm's as big as my legs. He said, you either punch him in the nose, or when you get home, I'm going to punch you in the nose. <laughs> well, if you put it that way. <laughs> so the next day at school, we went out to recess. And as usual, Jimmy came up, and he's going to boss me around, tell me what to do, and march me around as a fool. And so he reached to grab my hand and twist my arm behind my back. And when he did, I'd already thought this through. And I wheeled and I punched him right in the nose. His nose started bleeding. He couldn't believe it. He had his way with me all this time. And this time I punched him in the nose and he began to cry. He said, what'd you do that for? I said, you're not going to rule over me anymore. It's over. And he believed me. That was the last time. We were good buddies after that. He never, he never tried to boss me around and, and what do they call it, bullying. <laughs> we didn't even know what bullies were back then. But he was a bully. But we got to be good friends after that. You know what we need to do? We need to, we need to take the devil and just give him a good whack in the nose when he tries to interfere with our family, with our church, with our lives. And when the devil comes along and tries to entice you with lust, temptation of any kind, punch the devil in the nose and just stick close to your big brother, Jesus. He'll take care of you. The enemy is still attacking and people are still abandoning the ground where they ought to defend. And I'm trying to challenge our people. Take a stand. You'll feel better about it because you'll know that Shama did it. God blessed him and he'll bless you. Let's pray together. Father, we love you for giving us the Bible to inspire us and intrigue us, to instruct us, to direct us in the way that's right. I pray that you'd bless us tonight. Help us to have courage to stand. When it comes to our marriages, our families, our church, our jobs, with our personal character, doing what's right, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to defend the ground that we ought to defend and not be afraid to stand for what's right. Oh, it may be some pain involved. We know that, Lord. There may be some suffering from time to time, but we ought to stand, Lord, and we will stand if you give us your power your protection. Lord, bless us as a church. Bless our homes. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you need to come and pray, the altar is open. Anybody watching online, if you've never been saved, most of this, most of this didn't really mean a lot to you. What you need more than anything else, if you're lost, you've never been saved, what you need is a Savior. I want you to know Jesus Christ bled and died on Calvary's cross to pay for the sin that you could never pay for on your own. You'd have to go to hell and then even in eternity you wouldn't have it all paid for. The only way to heaven, Jesus said, was to be born again. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. you've never been saved, I challenge you tonight for your own eternal welfare. Trust Jesus tonight. Trust Jesus as your Savior.